I am deeply humbled to be here. Um, the last time I was here, I was sitting on the third row in the middle, getting ready to process to Duke Chapel to graduate. Um, and life looked much different for me then. Um, I was not intimately acquainted with sexual violence. Um, I had not had my heart uh, broken in numerous innumerable pieces. And more importantly, and more important than any of that, my mother was still here with me. Um, and so in almost two and a half to three years, a lot has changed. Life took some shapes and some turns for me that I was not prepared for. And being in this space reminds me of what life looked like before. Um, and I am thankful for the opportunity to be here, uh, Sora Sanya, for inviting me, and Dira for sneaking up on me um, and not telling me that she was coming uh, because she literally was just at my grandma's house last weekend and said absolutely nothing. Um, but I am happy and I stand here in a space of healing to tell you that it is possible, that it is possible. In the book, uh, The Salt Eaters by Tony K. Bambara, there is the healer, Minnie Ransom, who goes through the town and the city healing the women and before she does it, she asks them one question. She says, Shoot, sweetheart, are you sure you want to be well? Because wholeness is no trifling matter. She says, there is a lot of weight to carry when you are well. And here we are at midnight, um, the darkest point of the night and many of us know midnight and darkness very well. Many of us know what it is and what it feels like to cry by ourselves, whether it is the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, the loss of love, of hopes, of dreams. We know what it looks like to cry. We know what it looks like for the shadow of the night to hide tears. We know what it's like for the clouds of longing to be the only thing that covers us at night because our mourning, our losses, leave us bare and vulnerable. And there are those moments where we hear the beautiful things and they have been said tonight that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and we can recite them. We know them by heart, but I can stand here and tell you that 8 a.m. came, and the sun was up, and I was still mourning, right? Noon was here, the heat of the day, and I was still clouded and shrouded in darkness because pain is that real. It is that real. There were no platitudes of religious uh, sayings. There were no scriptures that really could comfort me in the loss of getting the phone call in the middle of the night that my mother had had an asthma attack and died. There was no thing that I could find in scripture that made being a victim of sexual assault in my own home make sense. There was no redeeming or reclaiming any of those things. I literally had to sit and deal because that is what happens in life. We are not 
assured beauty every day. We are not told that sun will be the only thing that we see. We have actually been promised rain. And we don't get to dictate when the showers come. We don't get to dictate the storms. We don't get to dictate the winds. We don't get to dictate the lightning and the thunder. They come. And because I had done uh, the syllabus, the lemonade syllabus, when it came out, someone who thought that they were saying something beautiful and wonderful to me, dealing with um, the trauma of healing from sexual assault, told me, you know, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. I said, so what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. I literally, and Indira can tell you, anytime anyone said anything to me that made absolutely no sense, either after my mom died or after um, becoming vocal about sexual assault, I would ask them one question, what does that mean? Because the reality is we can say a lot of things. We can say a lot of things and they hold weight when you don't put them against the weight of real traumas and tragedies. They have beauty in an 11 o'clock morning service or in Bible study, but when you put them up against the realities of life, what does it mean? What does it mean? Paul, the uh, most of you, I'm pretty sure, have taken your exegesis course with him. Um, Paul and I did not, the Apostle Paul and I did not have a great time together while I was here. Um, but we rocked out with that beat anyway, amen. Um, but Paul had no words for me. Paul had no words for me even to begin to understand and explain what happened to me. I even asked the question, how is this going to work together for my good? Wow. How, am, how is me laying on the floor for two days, afraid to tell anybody what had just happened to me, how was God going to redeem that? And then I went to survivors groups and met other women who had dealt with the same things. And there was a sister who stood up and she said something that blew me away. She said, my rape will never be redeemed. She said it was evil. She said, but one day I am going to a place where it will not matter that that ever happened to me. And then she sat down. I was six, eight months removed from telling my friends what happened to me. The courage and the freedom that I got when she said this will not be redeemed, that there is evil in this world. There are some pains and some traumas that we must heal from that instead of wondering how this is going to produce a good thing. The focus needs to be how do we heal in the midst of this? How do I move forward? How do I, as I like to say, flourish? So I went back to that person who told me that when life hands me lemons, I am to make lemonade. And I told him, Okay, I got my lemonade, but my lemonade has vodka in it. <laughs> my lemonade has vodka in it. Because there was something about healing that had to be done on my terms. There's something about when Minnie asked the question to the women that she is going to heal, are you sure you want to be well? that is also asking, are you sure and are you ready to do the work of healing? 
And the work of healing cannot look like your friend's work. The work of healing cannot look like the work of your mother and of your grandmother and of the women of your church. It must be your own. And so I went on this journey and I said, God, if we gonna do this, we got to do this together in my own way and in my own space. I remember in theology here, while I was here, in Christian theology, Dr. Cologne Emmerich taught it that uh, semester. We were preparing for our midterm. And those of you all who have had the Christian theology, I think y'all are being taught by my favorite professor right now, Dr. J. Cameron Carter. But if you have had the course, you know that that, that midterm is a doozy. Because that midterm makes or breaks what you gonna do, right? Um, and I remember sitting in my room, in my apartment, with my, with my cards, trying to remember all the forms of atonement, trying to get down what soteriology really meant and what Christology actually is and what is a high Christology versus what is a low Christology. And I had to shut my book because if you could be the God who kept me from the time that I was before I was even born, when my mom refused to stand in front of the pulpit and apologize for being pregnant and unmarried, if you could be the same God who could carry me from then to now, you are gonna carry me through a Christian theology exam. And I had the same moment in my apartment in Princeton New Jersey, where I had to close a book and pull out a piece of paper and write everything that I believed about God. Not everything that I was told, but everything that I believed about God. I believe that Jesus died. I believe that Jesus rose. I believe that Jesus is coming back one day. I believe, and I still have the paper, I believe that in my darkest moment, you sit and hold my hand. I built the faith on those four principles. It had to be integral to me. So if you are sure that you want to be well, your healing process and journey must be your own. You have to be and must be reminded that even in the darkest moment of your life, you are still good and beloved. Like our sister, I went through my list trying to understand why these things happened to me. What did I do that would allow you to take my mother before I even got a chance for us to have children so she could be a grandma? What, what did I do so wrong that would allow my punishment to be that my mother died by herself and I am hours away? What, was my pun what did I do that required my punishment to be a broken heart by the person that I love more than anything in this world for him to stand in front of me and say, I just don't wanna be here anymore? What did I do so wrong that would allow you to create space in my life for someone to come into my home and violate me? What did I do? Just show me what I did. I will repent for it, and then we can move forward. Because when you grow up in church, you hear the scripts. You hear the narratives. Consequences for bad behavior. God is a jealous God. He chastens those who he loves. So when you heal and feel pain, that is a consequence to something that you have done. And so I asked him to show it to me, to show it to me, to show, show me what I did. And I promise if you show it to me, I will never do it again. And in the midnight, I literally heard 
If you think that I would be that way, why would you serve me? If you think that I could be that petty, if you think that I could be that vindictive, why would you serve me? There has to be something else, something more, something greater, something more beautiful to this life with God that does not reduce it and ourselves to tit for tat. The winds of life shift. The winds blow. There are days where we are basking in the sun and there are days where the rain pours and pours and pours with no end in sight. I had a moment two years ago where my life drastically shifted. But what about girls and women in third world countries and girls and women here in America who live under the persistent threat and death of violence every single day, who cry and ask, where is God? And so on this process of healing, I had to come to the realization that God is not the God who would give me these things as a consequence. And even so, that is not the God who would also use them to produce a certain kind of work and productivity of Christianity in me either. Things happen. There is pain. The problem is that we don't have a great language around grief and loss and pain. And so we quickly try to find ways to explain it. Right? So that if we are able to achieve this particular objective, then it means that this needed to happen for us to get to point B. So A had to happen in order for us to get to point B, right? One has to come before two. Because we think of God in that language, right? We think of God even in the minute, minuscule, large framework of how we even articulate our relationships with each other, right? And so you're here, right, in Div School. So we talk about the ways in which we have no capacity to understand or know God. And then it hurts, right? It hurts when we have to figure out what it means to live a life of pain. It hurts when we have to figure out what it means to make sense of a heartbreak, a rupture in life. When the kink, the thread, my grandmother is a sewer. She taught us all how to sew. If there is a knot in the thread, she would make us start all over again. Because there's something ruptured in the garment when you reach a knot, right? That happens with all of us. When we are going, doing fine, and then something hits us and hurts us, we don't know how to respond. And so our knee-jerk reaction as Christians and as church girls, like I always like to talk about us, is to realize or to assume that somehow God is responsible for this. Not so, not so. And so on this process to healing, realizing that my process, had, my process had to be mine and realizing that God walked with me in the darkness and literally held my hand through the valley of the shadow of death and reminding me that I was not promised an easy life and that some things cannot be redeemed, God also showed me that he, God is big enough for my complaints. God is big enough for my questions. God is big enough for my disappointments. God is big enough for me to say, I am mad at you. God is big enough for me to say, which I did, I'm not going to church. I sat at home for a year and a half. I sat at home for a year and a half because I didn't want to hear 
the it'll be all over in the morning. Because I was waking up and still crying. I was waking up and still hopeless, right? It wasn't over in the morning, right? And so the beauty of answering the question, yes, I am sure that I want to be well, got me to the point where I realized lemons aren't bad. We read these commentaries about life giving us lemons, so we must make lemonade. And I remember I read, I just, I was doing work one day and I Googled lemons and the healing properties of lemons. If you drink lemon juice every day, it'll clear your skin. Um, if you drink a teaspoon of lemon juice mixed with two teaspoons of water, um, it is antibacterial. Something that we have been told all of our lives is bad actually works to heal us. This loss, this grief that cannot and will not be redeemed somehow brought me closer to a God that didn't ever ask me to find a way to make sense of it. God is not asking me to make sense of, to try to understand why, and to give an explanation. God is just simply asking, can you trust me to get you through it? If night spills over into the morning and if night spills over into the next day, can you trust me to be there every second and every minute? Can you trust me when there will be no answers for any of it? Can you trust me when they move on and you cannot? Can you trust me when you are looking at everybody live the dream that you so desperately wanted? Can you trust me? And so, my lemonade has vodka in it. Because I am me. Because God created me and fashioned me in a way that allows for creativity to shine through even in its brokenness, right? Because we were created for much more than tears. We were created for much more than disappointment. We were created for much more than questions. We were created to give answers. And the answer is that healing is possible. I don't know what it will look like for you, but I know that you can have it. When Minnie Ransom asked this question in The Salt Eaters, she knows what the answer can be. It can be yes, if you are really ready to do the work. It can be yes, if you are ready to go on a journey with yourself and with God and allow for the beauty and the wonder of a just and a majestful and a, maj a majestic and a powerful and a loving God to walk with you. One who cried when I cried with me when I lost my mother. One who sat those two nights with me in my bedroom floor. One who cried with me every single time I asked God why. And one who smiles with me now when I find a reason for joy, whether it is a sale at Sephora or whether it is my cousin sending me a video of her, of her daughter singing the Bojangles theme song. Whatever joy I find in this life, God chuckles because I'm moved from midnight at my own pace. Nobody pushing me. Nobody rushing me. I moved from midnight to morning, not checking a clock, but trusting my heart. Not saying, it's, it's 12.01, it's 12.02, I gotta be happy. But trusting that happiness would come when happiness was ready to come. Grief and sadness are companions that we will greet and we will meet and we must learn how to live with. We can't fight them.
because in their own ways they come. But what we can do, as Minnie Ransom has told us in The Salt Eaters and what my therapist tells me every Wednesday and what um, my friends who call and when we check on each other, what we can do is find ways to laugh in the midst of pain, find ways to breathe even when night is heavy. So I don't know when I will be in Goodson Chapel again. I don't know what life will look like the next time I am here. I don't know what life will look like for you, <clears throat> excuse me, the next time you are here. But what I do know is whatever you meet, you are equipped to face it. Because there is a God, there is a power, there is a strength, <clears throat> excuse me, in you that equips you for the journey. I hope that you have enough courage to trust the process. And when you don't, there's a little, as my grandma would say, medicine that you can slip into that lemonade that might give you enough courage to find strength for the journey. Thank you.